All right, good evening. Thank you all for uh, being here this evening. Good to see you all. It's only been a couple of days, but for some reason I just feel like it's longer. <laughs> and it's really good to see familiar faces and to see you all again. Uh, some of you, I just seen you yesterday, and it just feel like, you know, uh, I really miss you guys already. Don't get me crying. <laughs> but uh, I, I thank you guys uh, for all your support uh, up in Greenville yesterday for those who were able to make it out and those who had just been maybe were not able to make it out there, but you were definitely praying for the marathon. Obviously, it was a huge success, a huge turnout in general for that entire weekend. So um, I really believe it's just the beginning of, of great works uh, that will be done in that area. And just pray that you guys just continue to pray uh, for that church plant. It was a great turnout this morning. Uh, what was it, 110 that were in service this morning? And uh, there was some soul winning this evening. I believe that number that I heard was 12 that was, that was saved this afternoon up there. So. It is going good. It's jumping up there in Greenville, y'all. <laughs> it's going great up there in Greenville. So we pray that the Lord continue to do a great work. Uh, if you're with me there in, in Judges chapter 11, of my message this evening is life lessons from Jephthah. Life lessons from Jephthah. And, of course, I want to thank Pastor Burgess for allowing me to uh, stand forth in his shoes today and, and be in his stead and, and bring forth the word as we swipe pulpits. Uh, this afternoon. So life lessons from Jephthah. Here, uh, Jephthah is a very interesting uh, character. He don't have much that's written about him. After this chapter here, you really don't hear from him again until uh, Hebrews chapter 11, as he is in that hall of faith chapter of great, of great men of God and great women of God that, has, that have done great things for God. And he's mentioned in there as well but he only got one chapter here that's dedicated to him but it's it's just packed with so much doctrine and so many things that you could learn from him that's why i wanted to title this this uh, sermon life lessons from jephthah because if you really pay close attention to him in this one chapter you just really can just can just really unfold it like a or i would say peel it like an onion it's just so many things that just really jump out obviously you can't preach at all so it's just a few things that i'm going to uh, speak about with jephthah that just sticks out with jephthah so life lessons from jephthah so life lesson number one that we learn from jephthah we're going to look at his upbringing jephthah's upbringing he has a very interesting upbringing just these two verses here just kind of sums up what his upbringing is. Look at the first two verses. The Bible says, Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot. Remember that. He was the son of an harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. So Gilead is his father. His father has Jephthah with a harlot. Notice verse 2. It says, And Gilead's wife bear him sons and his wife's sons grew up and they thrust out Jephthah and said unto him thou shalt not inherit in our father's house for thou art the son of a strange woman Jephthah here has a very interesting upbringing his mother is a harlot and his father basically went in unto this harlot and he conceived they conceived a child and that child is Jephthah and Jephthah here, what's interesting about him, he has a, a similarity to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in that, in that same verse, verse 2, it says, And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah. Jephthah is thrust out by his brothers. He is rejected of his brethren. They don't want any affiliation with him. And isn't that the same with the Lord Jesus Christ where it says he came unto his own and his own received him not? You know, his own, his own brother, and they did not receive him. I like what the parable says in Luke chapter 19, verse 14. It says, but his citizens hated him. Now, isn't that the same thing that Jephthah said about his brother? And the Bible says to his brethren, what he tell them, he says in verse 7, did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? Well, this is interesting because the Lord Jesus Christ, speaking about himself in his parable to the Pharisees, he says, but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we would not have this man to rule over us. 
right? Uh, so he is a very, uh, a, Jeff is, we see some similarities with the Lord Jesus Christ here. Okay, so looking at Jephthah's upbringing, Jephthah has a mother, and his mother is a harlot. And Jephthah has a father who went in unto this harlot, and they conceived. But then his father has a wife as well. Now, as far as the dynamics of Jephthah's situation, I don't, you, the Bible doesn't really tell you that if Jephthah is born prior to his father having a wife, it doesn't mention that if he ended up, his father ended up having a adulterous situation where he cheated on his wife and had the baby out of wedlock with the harlot. It doesn't go into detail, but the bottom line is that his mother is a harlot, okay, and Jephthah has a wife. This is a very interesting upbringing that Jephthah is in because Jephthah is in a situation that he was born into and he has no control over it. He has no control over the household that he is born into. He cannot control the fact that his mother is a harlot. He cannot control the fact that his father just, you know, chose a harlot. We know the, the occupation of a harlot. She's a horse. She does whatever. She sleeps with a bunch of men. Jephthah cannot control what has happened and how he has gotten here, how he was conceived. He has no dealings with that. It just is what it is. And his brothers, his brothers consider this to be a big deal. They consider it to be a big deal because they're thrusting him away. But not only that, look at it. Why is it a big deal to them? Because what they're saying is that you and I don't have the same mother. They have the same mother, but then Jephthah is born out of wedlock. He has a mother who is not of the same mother as them. So this is why there is a big deal to his brethren. And then it says here, if you look at the end of, of verse 2, notice what his brethren say. Actually, look at the verse in general. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, and his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah. And said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house. Notice the reason. For thou art the son of a strange woman. So this is a big deal. They're saying you cannot inherit with us because you have a separate mother. We don't have the same parent. They're basically saying, or uh, basically the, the argument here is that you're born out of wedlock. That is the issue here. And then you look at this. Why are they thrusting him away? Well, because it's a shame. It's a shame. Basically, he's born out of shame. And they're saying, you cannot have any relationship with us. You can, they're going to thrust him out because it's a shame. It's a shame to be born out of wedlock. It is, it, it is what it is. The Bible calls it a bastard. That's what the Bible calls it. So because of this, they're thrusting him away because he is a bastard child. They don't have the same parent. And let me just insert that it is a shame. It is a shame to have children out of wedlock. It is a shame. And it's interesting that we live in a, a generation today where this is celebrated, where, where there's gender reveal parties going online, all type of foolishness, but foolishness is just going on over wedlock, it seems to be that marriage is becoming the minority where you say, hey, me and my wife are having a child and people, hey, great. <laughs> All right. Great. But then you say, yeah, me and my girl, we having a baby together. And they, whoa, really? People get excited over that. And this is this is the world that we live in where people get excited over bastard children rather than getting excited for a husband and wife coming together, having children in the right forms of, of marriage. This is what we see today. The standard now is have a baby out of wedlock. That's the standard. And marriage is looking like it's more of a minority. That's what it's come to. And young people, let me, let me just, you know, talk to the young people for a second, teenagers and all ages. It is important that you go to your wedding day. It will behoove you to go to your wedding day childless. Go to your wedding day childless. 
not having any children. That is the best thing you can do. Make sure that your children are produced within the confines of marriage. Make sure that your children are not produced outside of the confines of marriage. And this is why it's important that people wait until they get married and then have children. Because as we see from Jephthah, we see that this can, can alter some things. There is confusion. Not only that, but then you see that the siblings here, they start to disrespect the other sibling. They start to disrespect the other sibling because he's born out of wedlock. As you see that, they're thrusting him out. They hate him all because he's born of a strange woman. So this is what happens. This is the risk you run when you have children out of wedlock. When you have children before you married, if you end up having children and then you get married and then you have children with your spouse, you can run into a situation like Jephthah here where he's born out of wedlock and all his siblings are born within the confines of marriage. And now there is confrontation going on between the siblings because one is not born of the same mother. It will behoove you go to your wedding day a virgin for one and go to your wedding day childless. Have your children with your spouse. Not only that, but looking at Jephthah's situation, having the children inside the confines of marriage not only keeps down the confusion and the disrespect between siblings, where the Bible says that, uh, that the brothers, they grew up, the wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah. They grew up and came into the knowledge that, wait, we don't have the same the same parent and then it's there when they have grown up and they have come of age and they realize that wait we don't have the same parent and their goals to disrespect keep that in mind when you're having children out of wedlock but then not only that what about the peace in the marriage what about peace in the marriage right because if you have children outside of wedlock and then you decide that you're going to get married, where now you're going to have some conflict because there is a third will. See, part of the, the issue with Jephthah's father is that there is a third will. You know, Jephthah's mother is a harlot, but Jephthah's father, he married a woman. But yet he joined to her in a union. They became one flesh. But then there is a third will still there. He, who is the third will? The strange woman. The harlot, she is still there. Here's the thing, young people, and, and even if it's an adult who is not in this situation yet, this is why it's important to go to your wedding day childless because you don't want to go into your marriage with a third wheel. You want to go into the marriage where it's just you and your spouse. No children, and you guys start to produce children together within the confines of marriage. That is God's design. Here's the thing. You say, well, what's the big deal about this? Well, you don't want to be a man who has a wife, but then you have the third wheel there. You don't want to be a woman who has a husband, but you have a third wheel who is a strange man. Who is a strange man? Somebody that is not the husband, but you had a child with that person. Let me just put it in more modern terms, just in case someone's like, well, what is the strange woman or, or what is the strange man? Let me just put it this way. Maybe people will understand this. You don't want to have a, a man who has a wife, but then he has a baby mother. <laughs> Does that make sense? And you don't want to be a wife who's married to a husband and you have a baby daddy. <laughs> that is not what you want. And just getting this, this is why it's important. Go to the wedding day where it's just you and your wife, you and your husband joining in, in, in holy matrimony just together. It's just you all. This is why it's important. Because for those of us who are married, you already know marriage is going to bring its own habits. It's going to bring its own time of testing and tribulation. 
In the beginning, you all are, are happy, you googly-eyed, you can't stop looking at each other in the face, you happy, everything is good. But then, because there's this transition where you guys have to live with each other, you start to notice, man, she does some things I don't like. <laughs> or you recognize he does some things I don't like. You know, and, and you're starting to learn each other and you're starting to communicate. But here's the thing, that's just part of the marriage. And as the marriage goes on, it's going to have its own turmoils that come with it. Here's what I'm getting at. The marriage brings its own turmoil. And what you don't want to do is bring the baggage into your marriage. You don't want the third wheels coming in your marriage. You don't want the baby daddy. You don't want the baby mother coming into the marriage with you as well because that's going to be havoc by itself. And then you're joined into a wife that, nothing against women, okay? That's going to be a havoc by itself. Your spouse is going to be a havoc. Why are you adding more stress? You don't want that stress there. And here's the thing. If you had children out of wedlock, Listen, you can't change it. You, you can't change it. If you say, praise God, that sin, just like any other sin that you may have committed, it's under the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you of all sins. But listen, it, you can't go back and change that. You can't change that. But for those who have not done it, that's who I'm getting to. The ones who have not done it, please listen up and go to your wedding day childish so you won't be going through the situations that Jephthah is going through where he has half siblings and they're thrusting him out and there's confusion and all type of contention because they don't have the same parent. Do your children that favor. Do your children that favor. Jephthah is in a situation that he had nothing to do with. He cannot change that. This is what he was born into. It is what it is. So we look at Jephthah's upbringing. But then not only that, let's look at Jephthah's decision making. Jephthah's decision making. Look at verse 3. It says, Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. You say, what does that mean, vain men? Vain men were gathered unto Jephthah. Well, this is how I like to, to if I could give a definition of, of vain men, this, this is what my definition would be. And we're going to get to the Bible, how the Bible describes them as well. But vain men, these are just men that are the, and women, because there are some, you know, vain women too, but just van, van, people that are vanity. This is what vain men are. These people are the scum of the earth. These are the worst of the worst people. These are people who don't have any regard for life whatsoever. They'll do anything for money. They're, they're liars. They're without natural affection. They can kill people and sleep easy at night. They can be your, your, your hit man. You need somebody taken out? I got you. For how much money? I'll do it for you. These are these type of people. Not only that, they're, they're just children of the devil as well. They're children of the devil. Turn back to Judges chapter 9. Just a couple of chapters. And while you turn there, I said that they are just children of the devil as well. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 13. The Bible says, And Abijah stood up upon Mount Zimmerim, which is in Mount Ephraim, and said, Hear me, thou Jeroboam, and all Israel. Ought ye not to know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever? For, excuse me, forever? Even to him and to his sons by a covenant of salt. Yet Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and hath rebelled against his Lord. Notice these words. And there are gathered unto him vain men. Notice these words in conjunction with it. The children of Belial. Or some say Belial. The children of the devil is what he's saying. And have strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and tenderhearted. And could not withstand and could not withstand them. So we see that these vain men, what are they? They're children of the devil. 
And, and as we're about to see, when I said that these are just just people that are knock off somebody that you need killed, they'll do it, sleep easy, pay them the money, they'll take care of it for you with no thought. If you in Judges chapter 9, notice what Judges chapter 9 says. The Bible says in, in Judges chapter 9, verse 3, And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem, all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, He is our brother. And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Balbareth, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. To bring you up to speed, this is talking about Gideon's they Gideon of course had his name changed to Jerubal but Gideon had 70 sons and one of his sons decided that he was going to take out all his brothers and he's notice what he's done in verse 4 the end of it says that he hired vain and light persons which followed him notice what the vain and light people did it says in verse 5 and he went unto his father's house at Ophrah and slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubal. These are his own brothers. Slew his brethren, the sons of Jerubal, being three score and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding, yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubal, was left, for he hid himself. What do we see? The vain and light persons. They'll just kill you. No problem. No problem at all. Let's see this one more time, dealing with Jezebel. 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings chapter 21. First Kings chapter 21. This is Ahab. Ahab is upset because Naboth owns a vineyard that is his. And, and he wants that vineyard. He's saying, man, this, this just fits good for me. It's, it's situated in the right place. And he goes about it the right way. You know, if he wants to be, he's asking, hey, I would like to purchase it from you. Now, he's wrong and asked for that. They were not supposed to be swiping inheritances and things like that. But at least he's coming and saying, hey, you know, can we work out a deal? Can I buy this land from you? Okay, whatever. Maybe he remind them, hey, that's not what we're supposed to do. But he went about it the good way. He got the answer, no. And now he's just pouting. And he goes and tells his wife, Jezebel. And notice what happens. <clears throat> First Kings chapter 21, and notice verse 7. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Does thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? She's like, aren't you the king? You're up here pouting. You're crying. She said, Arise and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and, and to the nobles that were in his city, dwelling at, with Naboth, Naboth, excuse me. And she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, notice this, sons of Belial before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king and then carry him out and stone him, that he may die. Verse 11 says, And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles, who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them. And as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them, they proclaimed the fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. So we see the vain men. And, and we see that these vain men, they are just wicked people. They are the scum of the earth. And as I mentioned, they can just kill people. They can lie and deceive and it doesn't bother them. And going back to turn back with me to Judges chapter 11 with Jephthah. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, Jephthah, what did it say with Jephthah in verse 3? 
when he's thrust out from his brethren, verse 3 says, Then Jephthah fled from his brethren and dwelt in the land of Tob, and there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. What happens is that because of his upbringing, because he's thrust out of his brethren, he then decides that he's going to join himself to vain men, to light men, to wicked people. We see this all the time in, in modern day society, right, where people have a rough upbringing. They have a, a harsh upbringing. They, they go through a lot maybe in their, in their youth, and then when they get older, they just find themselves gathering themselves to just wicked people. They gathering themselves into some gang or so or something, some type of wicked action they just join themselves to. And we see this, this is the same thing with Jephthah. And when these people in modern society, when they join themselves unto vain men, you, they find themselves committing some of the most awful sins, all because they're joining themselves to vain men. You know, this reminds me of, you know, the alphabet community, right? The sodomites. This, it reminds me of this. And I'm not making any excuse for anything, but this, it is what it is. It is a proven fact that sodomy is tied into child molestation. It's proven that a lot of them in those situations, in that community, they are in there. It, it started from their upbringing. They're molested as children. And here's the thing. The Lord doesn't just let that action go unpunished. No, God is going to punish that evildoer who did that. But what happens is even though that person had a rough upbringing, as they go along, the Lord Jesus Christ is reaching out to them. He's trying to reach them. He's trying to get them saved. He's trying to let them know that, listen, you have a savior. I can pay Well, I have paid for all your sins. You can receive my atonement. All your sins will be gone. He's steady reaching out to them. But what do they say? We don't want that. They're rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't want that. But then well, who do they join themselves unto? Vain men. They join themselves because of their upbringing. And because they rejected the Lord, they find themselves gathering themselves unto wicked men, unto vain men in this same community here. So who do they join themselves to? The LGB community, right? Because of the upbringing. Like I said, I'm not giving it an excuse because the Lord reaches out to them to try to, you know, get them safe. But then the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, the Lord be witness between us if we do not sow according to thy words. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpe. Jephthah has a desire to be accepted. He want to be accepted. These same people who had no dealings with him and didn't want to have anything to do with him, when there's a war, they come to him and say, hey, you know, we, we're trying to bring you back in. And he, well, if you accept me, if, if, you, if I fight this battle, will you make me your head? Yeah, that's the reason we come back to you. And then what does he do? Verse 9, that's the, the main thing. Shall I be your head? You will let me, you will let me back in? You will let me hang again if, if, if I do this thing here? Jephthah, as I sense here, he has a, a sense of joy, in my opinion. To me, this is just a sense of joy. He has a sense of joy of the thought of being accepted. And, and this, this really... I, as I, and like I said, my opinion, I really believe he's happy about this because he actually takes it to the Lord in prayer. He actually takes it to the Lord. And it says in verse 11, then Jephthah went with the elders of, his, of Gilead and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpe. I mean, he's bringing it before the Lord. I sense that Jephthah is excited because he wanted to be accepted. And naturally, this is human nature. This is human nature that people want to be accepted. You know, no one just inherently just, I, I want to be the bad guy. I, I want to be hated. I want the world against me. If that's your, your thought process, that, that's a wicked thought where you're saying, I want to be the bad guy. 
No, it doesn't work like that. Just naturally, people want to be received. That just is what it is. You don't want people hating you. You don't want people rejecting you. So it's human nature to feel like you want to be a part of something. That's human nature. You study the ministry of Jesus Christ. His ministry was not that he intentionally wanted to be hated. That was not his intentions. He did, he did not come in looking to see who can I really stir up, who can I get against me. No. The Bible says he came to seek and save that which was lost. It also said that he came to minister. He didn't came to be ministered unto. He came to serve. He came to minister. So he didn't just come in, look, I want to be the bad guy. That, that was not the case. But we see that it turned out that way where he was just he just became that person that was hated. He didn't come in naturally wanting to do that. Gospel of John chapter seven, the Bible says the world cannot hate you. This is why it hates him. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. John chapter 3 says, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. The world hates the Lord Jesus Christ because of his testimony, because of the fact that he was preaching against the darkness. That's just is what that comes with the territory. But he came to serve. He didn't come in just looking to be hated. So tying this back into Jephthah with the fact that he wanted to be accepted. He, he's going to extreme measures to be accepted. You say, well, what's the extreme measures that, that Jephthah is going through because he wants to be accepted? Well, what is the context around? Isn't there a war going on? There's a war. And who did they come and find? Jephthah. And Jephthah agrees to go to the war and fight so he can be accepted. He's going to extreme measures to be accepted by these people to a point that he's willing to risk his own life. He's willing to kill other people. He's willing to also, he has a child, as we're going to figure out later on. He's also willing to allow his daughter to lose her father. The extreme measures that he's going to, to be accepted by people who really didn't even want any dealings with him in the first place. We're talking about life lessons from Jephthah. This here is a life lesson from Jephthah about wanting to be accepted. Here's one thing that you can realize that you can learn from Jephthah. Uh, this is how I look at it. Don't force relationships that aren't naturally happening. Do not force relationships that are not naturally. These are naturally his brethren, though he though it's a half brother, step brother. It doesn't matter. They are brethren. And he's going to extreme measures to make this relationship happen. Listen, if you got to go to extreme measures to make a friendship or fellowship work, maybe that's one that you shouldn't be having. Maybe that's a fellowship. When you got to step outside your comfort zone and step outside of who you really are just to please someone and be accepted of someone, maybe you shouldn't be having that relationship. And this is something that just personally Christians need to be on guard against. Christians have to be careful about going to extreme measures to be accepted of the world. You see this all the time where the Christians are trying to be like the world. They're trying to look like the world. They're trying to give off the world but still have that Christianity behind it. Make sure you don't go to extreme measures. You say, well, what's an extreme measure where a Christian will try to please the world to a point that they go to an extreme measure? They want to be accepted of the world so bad that they go to an extreme measure. What's an example? Well, here's an example. Just tampering with the Bible. Tampering with doctrine. The Bible says one thing, and you say, well, because you want to please the world, because you want to be accepted of the world. Well, yeah, I know what the Bible says about this, but, you know, well, depending on the culture, you know, this, that's not really what the Bible says. So you're explaining it away. Also, you can be accepted. You're going to extreme measures where you start denying what the Bible says just so you can be accepted. 
How about just tampering with the order of service? You say the order of service. Yeah, a church service. People are catering, excuse me, churches are catering their services to look like the world. Why? So they can be accepted of the world. So they pattern. I mean, how many churches look like a rap concert? <laughs> many of them. It, it, it's, it's a shame that Christians go to extreme measures to be accepted of people who don't want you in the first place. The world hated the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are a Christian, what do you think is going to happen to you? If you walk in this word, what are you going to do? What's going to happen to you? You're going to be hated as well. The servant is not above his master. The Lord said, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So why is Christians trying to conform, trying to look like the world and be like the world so they can be accepted of them? Looking back at Jephthah, Jephthah has a desire to be accepted to the point of I'm willing to kill somebody to be accepted. I'm willing to go to war and possibly kill innocent people who are just in the war because they're drafted into a war. So that's just what that nation do at age 20 or so. These young men, they, they did nothing to me, but because I want to be accepted, I'm willing to kill someone. Be on guard against going to extreme measures to be accepted. Here's another life lesson from Jephthah, Jephthah's swift speech. Jephthah's swift speech. This is historically what he's known for. Somebody that just speak before he actually thinks about it. If you jump down to verse 29, the Bible says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever coming forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. We're talking about a swift speech, just speaking, not even thinking about it before you actually start talking. You know, this is my opinion, and I'm firm on this. I'm convinced that Jephthah did not have to make this vow. He did not have to make this vow. If you just study the book of Judges and, and how the book of Judges go, you know that once the Spirit of the Lord came upon someone, it, it was over with. You know, you, you crushed. You're done. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, or when the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, whatever army that is, whatever the judge it is where the Spirit of the Lord come upon them, they were emboldened. They did great things for God. God was on their side. Verse 29 says, then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. You didn't have to make this vow, Jephthah. You're not impressing God. God was already on your side. His Spirit came upon you. And if you look at the, how judges go, this is how it goes, where the judge has the spirit upon them and they do a great thing. This was not necessary, but the swift speech. This was not necessary. What we learn from Jephthah is that we have to make sure that we're not hasty in our speech unto God, where we're just uttering anything before God. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And this is something that we all, including myself, we all just need to, you know, as, as they say, think before you talk. Think before you talk. 
especially when you're talking to God. You better think about it. You better think about the vow that you are making before you open your mouth unto the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, the Bible says in verse 1, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. <clears throat> he didn't have to make the vow, but then because we're talking about a hasty speech, Learn from Jephthah not to be hasty. Think about, you know, the, the vow that you're making before the Lord. I think the best example you could use today, and we see this everywhere, is where people are vowing before the Lord. This is the person I'm taking in marriage. I'm making my vows unto, unto, unto my wife or unto my husband. We're doing it in the sight of God. We're asking for God's blessing. We're praying during our ceremony. You, you're asking God to bless you, but then as you're opening up your mouth and say, yeah, Lord, I'm going to be here, sickness and health, yeah, I'm going to be here till death do us part. But then what do we see today? Just divorce is on the rampant. And, and I guarantee 99% of them have made vows to their spouse saying, I will be here for you. I will be there for you until death do us part. And you're opening your mouth being hasty. And he's saying here, for God is in heaven and thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. You, you better think about it before you go before God saying, God, this is what I'm going to do. But then here's the last thing that we can learn. We learn from Jephthah's hasty speech. Don't be hasty. Right. But then here's the last thing we look at, that Jephthah is a man of his word. Jephthah is a man of. Of his word. Go back with me to Judges chapter 11. And like I said, this was a vow that he did not have to make. He didn't, the Lord was already on his side. But then notice what he say. He, he is a man of his word. Verse 34. And Jephthah came to Mispi, unto uh, his house. And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. And she was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. Notice these words. For I have opened my mouth unto the Lord. And I cannot go back. And she said unto him, my father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as the Lord had taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. That verse specifically in verse 35, he says, I open up my mouth. I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back talking about someone that is a man of his word here's what I believe God did not want Jephthah's daughter as a sacrifice that's not the sacrifice he wanted it is clearly evident in verse 29 the man already had the victory this is not what God wanted. And we don't see in here where God is stopping him and saying, hey, don't do this or anything. But clearly, does God want his children sacrificing their children? No. Is this not something that he chided with the people of Israel for, for sacrificing their children in the fire to the devils? So you think he wants Jephthah to set his daughter on fire as a burnt offering? Is that pleasing? We see where Abraham and Isaac is carrying out a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he's about to slay him, the Lord calls from out of heaven and tells him to stop. 
That's not the sacrifice that I want. I'm going to provide myself. The Lord will provide himself a lamb. The Lord has the sacrifice. He doesn't need your daughter. This was something that Jephthah did not have to do, nor do I believe that this was pleasing to God. Not at all. But one thing we got to give Jephthah, he's a man of his word. I don't agree with what he did. But you got to honor the man is a man of his word. He said, I, opened, I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. He reverenced the Lord that much to a point where he said, I can't reverse my word. Well, to God, there'd be more people like this, right? People that are just men and women of their word, that when they say something, they mean it. When they say they're going to do something, listen, they're going to do it. Now, things come up. It is what it is. Things come up and, and things happen, okay? But... When you're talking about going before the Lord, Lord, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You better make sure you're a man or a woman of your word. And we hear this all the time. Lord, I promise I'm sick, but you get me well. I promise, Lord, I'm going to be in church every single Sunday. <laughs> they get healed. And then what? Yeah, I, I got I to gotta go to work, man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you opened up your mouth. Unto the Lord. Can you be a man of your word? Amen. Or when you were down and out, you were making vows. Now you're well, and you didn't forget all about it. Jephthah is a man of his word, and that is how we should be. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, uh, chapter 5. And actually, you don't have to turn there. Uh, I'm going to skip that. Basically, chapter 5, verse 4 speaks about how the Lord says you, you make a, a vow do not delay to fulfill it. Don't, don't put it on hold. Make sure you fulfill that vow. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 says, Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, Neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Basically, if you say something, be a man of your word. Let your yea be yea. Your nay, nay. I can't do it. I can't do it. Like I said, things come up. Okay, we, we understand it. But don't just be this person that... Every time somebody look at you, man, he be, he be lying. He say he's going to do something. He don't, you don't want to be that, that person there. So just a recap on Jephthah here as we see lessons learned from Jephthah. We, we looked at his, uh, his upbringing. And one thing I want to credit Jephthah that in spite of his upbringing, in spite of him being thrust out by his brethren, in spite of being a, a, a son of a harlot and being born out of wedlock, in spite of that, you know, Jephthah, as I mentioned, is in the Hall of Faith. None of those things held him back from doing great things for, for God. So it doesn't matter how you got here. Make sure you just work for God. How about that? So we've seen Jephthah's upbringing. We've seen his decision making. Don't make the wrong decisions like Jephthah where he's gathering vain men unto him because of the things that happened right before in his life or in his upbringing. Don't get with the wrong crowd. We see his desire to be accepted. Don't just go to the extreme measures because you want to be accepted of people. But then the hasty speech and also the man of his word. He just held true to what he said he would do. It's not right, but we can learn from that to be men and women, children as well of our word. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these life lessons that we learned from Jephthah. Truly, these things are here for a reason. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, Lord God. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that we would just continue to study your word and, and learn much. We ask that you bless us this evening as we uh, depart and ask that you would um, bless us together once more later in the week. In Jesus' name, amen.